Hello everyone, today we talk about the early Imperial Roman army officers uh, from essentially the reform of Augustus, looking essentially at how the, the chain of command worked uh, at the top in the Roman military. What was the specific mention of all these various officers and why essentially this political before the military system worked the way uh, it did. All right. So Augustus uh, made multiple videos about him, but of course we still have to frame the entire, say, epochal change that came together with essentially the most um, accomplished politician in the history of mankind. Um, you have a stabilization of a permanent professional army uh, across the frontiers mostly, but also for the defense of specific imperial, that is, um, personal assets of, of the monarch, uh, separated from the, the ones of the senatorial provinces, that represented a bit like the cornerstone of the strategic stability of, of the empire. I made a video also on the quality of Roman leadership, uh, we have observed just recently how the Roman army was fundamentally born with the very strong conviction that the uh, richest and more powerful uh, Roman citizens were essentially to carry the burden of the greatest responsibility as much as the, uh, the, the highest offices accordingly. Uh, and this is exemplified by the establishment that carried out the clamorous Roman conquest of the Mediterranean and of Europe, right? And that was, in fact, founded properly uh, to that extent under Augustus. It really gave a um, so European dimension to the empire, not just a Mediterranean one overall, and would, in fact, go as far as essentially molding the especially the western provinces that were also the ones providing with the greatest um, manpower uh, historically. That's also in part how Augustus had won the, the civil wars uh, himself in the west. Um, and so the individuals that covered the command posts were particularly, say, representative of not just the, the, the elite uh, itself, but of a conviction that, of course, in order to be in that place, uh, they had to, say, uh, to embody certain specific qualities of Romanity, so the same spiritual ones that had brought the, the Empire to the world conquest. With the reform of Augustus, the command of the legion that in the so-called Republican times were entrusted to the same consul or um, delegated by him to one or more tribunes was entrusted to a legatus Augusti pro praetore, that is to say a magistrate of senatorial rank that had exercised the functions of praetor and that had been nominated directly by the emperor, right? So, when here we will encounter different uh, magistracies, offices, etc. So we know uh, what what we're talking about. It, the consul, the consul had this highest um, military uh, authority uh, in uh, in Rome, right? Together with this political one as the commander in chief of the Roman army. Right. He was responsible for leading military campaigns, protecting Rome from external threats. This was a collegial magistracy, which meant that there were two councils uh, at, the same, uh, at the same time. However, in early imperial times, the consular command function was largely symbolic, as the concrete military power was often concentrated in the hands of of the emperor and his appointed generals. So the, the consul also had some ceremonial duties such as leading processions and conducting sacrifices. This had naturally limited the original 
political rather than just military power of the consuls and of the proconsuls that, as you know, were essentially sent uh, to the various provinces in order to enforce the de facto uh, control of the same and the fact that this had become even say, more important um, in, in the later uh, Republican period. The tribunes uh, remained there, right, because the uh, administrative management of the legion contemplated the legatus to be assisted, right, by, in fact, continuity with the tradition of the Republican legions by six tribunes, right? One was of senatorial rank, the Tribunus Laticlavius, um, that was virtually com- second in command, really, and five of equestrian rank, known as the Tribuni Angusti Clavi. Thus, the Tribunus Laticlavius was a young senatorial officer who served as a junior officer, in fact, in, the, in, in, in a legion, usually as a military tribune or staff officer as well. Um, this depended, of course, on who he was, how he had gotten there in the first place, everything was coordinated um, politically, right? This was the, say, next generation of commanders, and that's why also they had to rise uh, through, the, through the hierarchy in his mansions. Uh, the Tribunus Laticlavius was called like this because he wore a broad purple stripe, that is to say, in fact, the Latus white clavus um, on their tunic, a symbol essentially of their rank uh, and status. And he was responsible for various tasks, such as uh, supervising the legionary discipline, right, training, um, instruction of new records, uh, and the organization of logistics and supplies. So that's quite an experience, of course. The Tribunus Angusti Clavius, instead, was uh, an equestrian officer serving also as a staff officer as assistant of the Legatus, Legionis, the commander of the legion. And they, uh, th- this um, Tribuni, were selected from the aristocracy. They distinguished, uh, were distinguished by a narrow purple stripe, the Angustus, in fact. Clavus on their tunic, and the Tribunus Angusti Clavius assisted in administrative and logistical matters, as well as coordinating the legionary military operations uh, and such. All right. Um, so the Tribuni Angusti Clavi were to be at least usually older and more experienced than the uh, colleague of senatorial extraction. Because they, generally speaking, came from previous command experiences. Now, still in Augustan times, in spite of the um, permanent nature that the Roman military was acquiring just as a broader force, the original uh, concept that fundamentally Roman commanders were uh, appointed ad hoc, right? Even with some level, of course, of conventional cyclicity and some sort of numerical uh, standard, however, bearing over time, uh, was um, not fully institutionalized, right? There was not a fixed number of posts that were more regularly defining the uh, path of the officer's career. Here we're looking at not just as a, it doesn't matter how efficient uh, the Roman army was and how, in fact, uh, say, self-standing it, it, uh, it was becoming thanks to the state. There hadn't been yet a full frame for, even for the NCOs, right? We'll see it in another video, um, of career path that you could quite simply identify like a specific job with specific rules, conditions, um, fixed pay, and, and so on. Thus, the career dynamics for those belonging to the highest ranks were institutionalized by Claudius in the second half of the first century. Suetonius Claudius 25 tells us this, and they would remain at that point in force for more than two centuries afterwards. Right. So this shows you how the same 
modern secular concept, let's say, of uh, sort of republican and and Ro and, um, and statal right system in in the Roman world it was actually not really there until pretty late in time because it was really about who controlled the elite who controlled uh, the uh, the empire such the the repartition in Augustan times between imperial and senatorial provinces the um, uh, essentially the, the those uh, political and military dynamics that uh, revolved around the warlords and the um, in fact in the same soldiers and how these had been used by Augustus to found an order that would be gradually regulated by his successors All right. for example the term tribunus laticlavius that we just saw um, took taking the name from the large um, band, the clavus of purple uh, embroidered traditionally on the tunic, was usually the first military office for a member of the senatorial rank. The young tribunus found himself as second in command of a legion, even uh, without, being, without any specific uh, experience, as we've seen before that, at least, it could even happen, but this was a way to centrally politically promote the Roman nobility in that specific role of command that, however, was really thought to have been a merit of, of the originary clan because, of course, the senators had received, just by their um, cursus honorum, a set of specific uh, tasks that, in, in, in these great houses were a matter of how say the, the Roman elite had just come to be right essentially a, a militarized one right that was just by even sort of civilian peaceful practice a um, say uh, commander of people of land right at home the slaves the clients uh, and so on and so that these um, science were just somehow already predisposed by by identity by stock by um, by custom to envision as their future right so of course the um, the difference in experience was uh, important but the ranks were designed exactly to sort of elevate further these uh, young elements to go through in fact the full career that had naturally to bring them to higher posts um, in virtue also of hopefully the um, the capacity that they had showed right the command of a legion like the one that uh, was uh, received by the legatus in fact legionis so literally the delegate to the to the chosen bunch because that's fundamentally what legion practically means um, the elect of the troops uh, in the original form of recruitment right in the Roman arm uh, could be in any case entrusted only after a period of some years in fact spent exercising a series of uh, magistracies and offices like the uh, quaestura and the praetura that were uh, civilian ones right so you could even have, of course, some legati that were devoid of previous military experience, but it, it also depends on, on what kind of task they were entrusted with, right? This happened also on numerous occasions, even giving place to, to military uh, disasters. But the system st still worked, and this is something you want to appreciate, also considering the fact that throughout most of the early empire, the Roman legions didn't really have much of a of an intensive, continuous employment. I mean, they had a deterrent function that was enough just per se to tame the, the, the populations that lived uh, from this side and the outer part of the so-called uh, limes that was not even, in fact known as this by the Romans, that considered the legions as the monumentum, right, as that sort of force capable of extent projecting 
uh, morally and strategically across a much broader space than in fact what the, the same what we think geographically the Roman Empire to have been um, usually the legatus of a legion exercise the command for two or three years usually the legatus legionis exercised uh, his command for two or three years right waiting essentially to be able to follow a series of um, increasingly important offices such as for example the governor of senatorial and imperial provinces um, so as we've seen again in the aforementioned video about the quality of Roman leadership the point right from from a cultural point of view where the Romans made essentially made their elite their ruling um, establishment um, passing through such military tasks eventually for a career that would have not culminated with that aside from reasons of political uh, in this case stability and so also of central control as we will see now through some even the question um, elements at the hand of some of the most strategic uh, lands uh, of the empire was the original traditional one of say proving through the same military experience to be able to wield the imperium so managing a series of tasks that were indeed um, challenging right you could have it easier or more difficult right but the sense is that a legatus augusti pro praetore was um, often assigned to areas that were deemed strategically important or potentially rebellious so they uh, would learn uh, throughout this experience uh, what 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 it mattered as far as maintaining a significant stability uh, in a region uh, also putting down rebels uh, say defending land from invasions and or even launching uh, offensives well across the Limes uh, and reinforcing in fact Roman deterrence through actual uh, use of force um, and the legatus per se had the, the important uh, historical authority of raising and leading the legion or also uh, auxiliary forces that as you know were essentially uh, just always next to the to the uh, citizen soldiery and to enforce in the lands to which they were assigned the emperor's policy and laws in general because of course there was not a, a marked difference let's say, say like in contemporary times we can say this there is the military and there is a civilian office because the imperium spiritually manifested in reality throughout all these actions and it's a very close of itsian concept because of course war is nothing but a um, political uh, mean right so uh, the uh, fact that you are, say, showing, for example, a, an administrative capacity that is also the one, in fact, that you're expected eventually in your cursus honorum to be taking on increasingly, in an increasingly important and effective way, is demonstrated by the way you employ uh, the, use, the use of force, uh, the, the military uh, as such. The um, rank of the province was determined usually by the number of legions that were stationed there and their legati were to the direct dependence of the local governor that thus should have been again a guy that had already been through that experience uh, in the case of a province with a single legion like it happened in say in Spain or or Africa uh, the same governor was at the same time the legatus because essentially the the local situation was not particularly uh, demanding right also from a strategic point of view uh, differently from say you know the, the Rhine or Danubian or Mesopotamian frontier right? that were surely more problematic but in any case the general uh, point being that the unity of command had to pass through the 
uh, the control, so the, the coordination between the various legati in a single uh, province sometimes that had, however, to act uh, in unison from a strategic point of view. So these were the true commanders that were given the military mandate from the governor and acquiring fact that strategic experience connected uh, with the exercise of, of their command for the later times which they they would have been themselves uh, at the command of multiple forces right at the head of these provinces. A um, member of the equestrian rank began usually his military career with an office of praefectus of uh, cohort, um, auxiliary infantry usually, uh, normally of quingenaria type, so essentially 500, roughly 500 men, for eventually taking on the office of auxiliary infantry cohort praefectus, generally of a quingenaria cohort, so one counting roughly 500 men, for eventually taking on the office of tribunus angusti clavius, as we have seen in, in, a, in a legion, right, and finishing uh, eventually as praefectus at the command of an auxiliary cavalry ala. Uh, this path was institutionalized by Clodius as well. It was uh, known as the name of tres militiae, that is to say the three militias fundamentally, deriving from this uh, uh, sort of uh, command of uh, different chunks of the legion fundamentally and also in this case it was propedeutic to the achievement of further prestigious civilian and political offices right through the career of procurator that is governor of provinces not garrisoned by legions it was possible in theory to reach the important position of Praetorian prefect, the praefectus praetorio, that is to say the commander of the Praetorian Guard and of the Square of Rome, right, this uh, highest office reserved to the equestrian rank. Otherwise, you could uh, reach the same, uh, the same uh, hierarchy. Alternatively, it was possible to cover those offices also uh, through the centurionate and the primipilate, that is to say, um, as a centurion and even more as a centurion primipilus, that is the first spear centurion, the centurion, the first cohort of the legion, so the most important. Uh, he was actually an officer proper, right, differently from the, the other centurions who were NCOs, right, so that, that's why we covered them as well. Um, and this was, however, overall, that from the centurionate in general, a theoretical option also for those few that, albeit not coming from the equestrian ranks, could obtain, in fact, the office um, of Primus Pilus. And this is fascinating because uh, it shows how the Roman army really offered, in theory, to say even the to the last of, of the Roman citizens the opportunity through this astonishing feat of the primipilate that basically equated in wartime that you had risen through the ranks as the single most competent fighter and NCO of, of the entire legion, right? It means you had easily killed uh, hundreds of people by your own hand in different ways, not necessarily just in combat, but you know, you, you would have seen really a lot of stuff and surely a lot of action uh, in the first place. Uh, and this um, was um, was, a, was an opportunity for, for also those who were not equestrians, right? But regarding the equestrian career in itself, you realize that um, it also mirrors, in fact, the, uh, the, the senatorial one in this relation uh, with it, as its um, also military expertise was fundamentally a bit more in between. Like the questions were traditionally, as you know, the the knights, right? Um, and there was here, as you see, some cavalry command. 
And the fact that the equestrians would um, be commanding the auxiliary troops as a majoritary mansion, because as Tribuni and Gusticlavi in a in a legion, thus of at the command of Roman citizens, they would have commanded mostly infantry uh, themselves in a section essentially of, of the of the army. But uh, by commanding a generally a corps quingenaria, they would essentially gain uh, a pretty consistent military experience, at least if serving properly uh, in a war zone, because, as, as we know, the, uh, the allies were, were employed in ways that fundamentally were to uh, pave uh, the, the, the road to the, uh, the legionary infantry that constituted the majority uh, of the legion. Um, and that, um, however, w- even as the, the most punching force uh, would be employed just in, say, sort of definitely bloody engagements, but cleaner from an operational point of view that had to be, again, um, created as a condition by the auxiliary forces, right? Um, and the auxiliary forces would always cooperate and campaign, uh, say, around the legion, so what these um, equestrians got as an experience was particularly functional to that essentially proper middle um, position between the the higher, say, the commanders of, of the legion and the um, and the and the same and the same soldiery, right? There was surely also a didactic, exemplary uh, function that the equestrian had. Uh, by his knightly status towards the auxiliaries that were naturally looking up to these guys as provided as Roman knights with some higher, in fact, um, spiritual, heavenly, um, Apollonian uh, face that would have brought them, right, to elevate themselves. Most of these people were fighting to get the Roman citizenship in the first place. And so once you had, essentially, the questions would have be commanding also the, uh, the the Roman legionaries, but they would terminate the tres militiae office that could open even through, again, uh, say, the, the important post of uh, commander of, of the Imperial Guard, uh, uh, a cavalry uh, post, right, a cavalry command post of the auxiliary cavalry that, by the way, was an experience also for the same Romans, given that mostly th- these um, cavalry auxiliaries were drawn from populations that had quite an equestrian culture themselves. And so uh, the Romans were, say, relatively gentrified as far as, especially the, the, the lifestyle of, of um, horsemen just per se, right, in the, also from this uh, knightly background, right? So it was a way to learn also from these people some other insight, right? Um, For, say, reviving, refreshing the knightly expertise of the equestrian order, which is, I think, very beautiful to think to uh, in this way. The tasks of the tribunes in continuity, essentially, with the republican tradition consisted especially in the ordinary management of a legion, and in particular in the administration of justice, and in the resolution of organizational, logistical problems um, that could, however, leave um, space also for tactical ones, which uh, could be, in fact, tasked to the, to the legatus, such as the command of one or more cohorts, or um, tasks of, say, civilian type to support the provincial governor, which essentially entailed some police function, which is also interesting because, you know, the, even when provinces were pacified, uh, well, don't think that everything was smooth in the sense that this was still a largely feudal world of some sort that required to enforce the law, to solve, uh, you know, the, the, the controversies within the same system. There could be rebellions. Um, 
also take guerrilla stuff like that so um th it was a hell of an experience just to be uh within these ranks and as you understand here it's fascinating to see how the roman army was de facto commanded by senators and equestrians right and you could barely have any other chance if you're not you were not part of it but it, it illustrates the hierarchical nature of the same so this was important as far as the the discipline the the drive the the vision of the roman army was concerned the entire system in fact was designed to self say perpetuate the same values and this sort of um mutual support from the, the var even the unequal components of of this uh, of the of the roman armed forces right even you see the the sen the senatorial uh and uh, the equestrian orders the the roman citizenry and the uh, the foreign troops all right uh, from much later times there is uh, an interesting passage from the digestum of justinian uh, this is um uh, 49 16 to 2 right this legal collection says the task of the tribunes naturally was not say the same but that's also in part what we know about um the former say the, the function of the tribunes in the former centuries the task of the tribunes or of those uh, that are proposed to command of an army is the one to keep the soldiers in the encampments to uh take them out for the training to keep the access to the to the camp to organize every once in a while some watch guard to supervise the food distribution to the soldiers and controlling the quality of the same repressing the frauds of the of those who were deputed to the distribution because I understand there was a lot of subcontracting and somehow um, corruption um, to punish those crimes, the, the crimes, according to uh, his own authority, be uh, often present at the uh, in the, uh, the command of, of of the army, of the legion, or the sum of multiple of them, and to uh, hear the requests of the soldiers, inspecting the hospitals. So, say it was were a bit like fucked out of the situation. Um, and the third officer in command of the legion established likely in augustian times was the praefectus castrorum now this is a key figure really this was um career militiaman of the equestrian order often coming from the inferior ranks and uh, uh, however at least from the centurion right because you could go through that career as i've seen if you essentially both the post uh, as centurion where you could be uh, and then you could rise through that path as an equestrian uh, as well uh, however the tasks of the praefectus castrorum at least as we learned from the later the jetsus to 10 speaking of the early empire but um, in fact you know, not just being a later source, but often speaking of the previous centuries. This is, but we don't know exactly, often to which extent, uh, included the um, organizational management of the camp in which the legion was based. Right. So, the exercise of the administrative, financial um, functions that in the order republican system uh, were usually pose in the hands of the quaestor this is fascinating because this guy was not just as we will see now a a very experienced uh military man with very specific uh technical expertise but he was entrusted in that sense to make the, the camp work also through the supplies through logistics right the praefectus castrorum uh had learned from the field uh for a long time uh, and as such, he was considered one of the most prestigious figures in absolute terms, right? It embodied, if you want, the best of the Roman meritocracy uh, in the army. And he was a crucial figure for the rule of Egypt, right? The Praefectus Castrorum 
was the facto command of the province in as much as the command of the legions was entrusted directly to him right and uh as you know egypt was uh that province in which you you couldn't have even the pr- the presence of functionaries of senatorial rank because of course from augustan times uh that reminded of the civil war uh, and the wealth of egypt um also as a logistical and supply basis for for the east um the say the, the fight against uh, Rome had been carried out, and so um, legitimately the emperors had essentially maintained control of uh, this land through uh, a trustee and avoiding any any senator to have to to develop some clientele's connections, etc., uh, that could bring him to the, anywhere near to the political or even uh, more dangerously military control of this region that uh, was imperial in any case so the settlement had already been uh, established in that sense so we can make a um, sort of recap of this uh, career path because it's uh, very illustrative of the uh, the actual hierarchy and how it worked so from the top down for the career officials of senatorial order proconsul provinciae that was a former consular governor of a senatorial province and at this point institutionalized we're talking about say the ones who would remain um there would be two uh two posts uh proconsul was essentially again a former consul and senator appointed to govern in fact the province of the Roman Empire, and the say especially imperial times that were usually assigned to more important and larger provinces where they had significant military administrative powers, including the command of the provincial army and the ability to impose taxes uh, and laws. Then you would have the legatus Augusti pro praetore. These were um, governors of imperial provinces with three legions. And there were three posts for this. Um, and a legatus, as we've seen, was um, the, the, the legatus pro praetore was a senatorial officer appointed by the Roman emperor to act as his representative, de facto, consistently as a military commander in a province or region. And somehow still, uh, by some degree, more important than the same um, consul in practice right they had the same rank as a provincial governor but were often assigned to areas that were deemed strategically important or potentially rebellious they had the authority to raise and lead a legion or an auxiliary unit and to enforce the emperor's policy and laws Uh, then you would have uh, actually another uh, say a lower legatus augusti pro praetore uh, that would be the government of in, imperial province but with two legions and there were eight posts of this guy then you would have uh, two consuls as it had been always the case for this collegial magistracy so as the highest ranking magistrates uh, of, of the roman empire at least in a, in a traditional fashion and elected annually by Roman senators and people and one of their main functions uh, had historically been of course the command of the Roman armies either in person or by in fact delegating as it's more the case in this period the role to a legate or praetor right they were responsible historical for maintaining law and order in Rome as well as in the provinces and for conducting diploma- uh, d- diplomatic uh, negotiations with foreign powers as well which as you understand also from a political and strategical point of view is quite fitting now you would have under the consul other uh, another other type of legatus augusti pro praetore as governor of imperial province with one or no legion and there were 12 posts of this guy right this is particularly interesting 
uh, and uh, this would mean consider that a Roman legion was uh, essentially 5,500 5, around for five to six thousand soldiers at this point. And so, as we've seen, the the legate in general had this um, military skill and experience, was responsible for training, discipline, morale of their troops, planning and executing military campaigns, sieges, and battles. And in these cases, um, they could have the case in which they they controlled essentially one legion or none, because there could be uh, auxiliary forces instead, it could be the case, they were de facto the governors of these uh, imperial provinces. Then you, you would have the proconsul provinciae, that was the governor of a senatorial um, province, and there were eight posts of this sense. Then you would have the uh, legatus uh, legionis, then you would have the, the praetor, the quaestor, uh, the uh, take this were senior, ma say the, the praetor was a, a senior magistrate, the quaestor a, a junior one, the, the former uh, was essentially second in rank to the consuls. They were usually responsible for administering justice both in Rome and the provinces. It's very important because they were provided with, um, say the, in, the, in the case of the praetor, with uh, the Imperium as well, right? Um, they supervised generally, however, mostly public and private contracts uh, and transactions. Some praetors had were given mil military commands, such as the governorship of a province and the leadership of an arm. Uh, the quaestors instead were notoriously responsible for managing the financial affairs of the state and the army as well. That naturally. Uh, cost quite a lot in the uh, start of um, assets. They were usually assigned to a consul or a provincial governor for also for this purpose and were in charge and instruction of new records and the organization of logistics uh, and supplies. Right. Finally, would had, there were, by the way, 18 posts, say 23 posts for the legatus legionis, then um, 18 for as a praetor, 20 as a quaestor, 27 as a tribunus laticlavius, and 20 as a vigintivir. The vigintiviri, or the 20th men, the 20th men, were a group of magistrates who were responsible for various public duties, such as, for example, the organization of games and festivals that could, as you know, involve uh, the army often, the supervision of public buildings and works, the registration of citizens and freedmen were usually uh, elected, uh, say, historically by the Comitia Tributa, a popular assembly of the Roman people, and served for one year. And some Vigintiviri were also given minor military appointments, such as the command of a court or the supervision of a supply depot, uh, for example. So you understand here how somehow developed, of course, this entire system really was. Then if we were to look at, so we are here towards, say we can say by by the mid, from, from Claudius times, right, from the mid second century. The same goes for the career um, of um, the officers of equestrian rank that had this different options. So you could enter from the centurionate, as we've seen, as a primus pedus, which would bring, uh, say, of course, uh, this uh, task of serving as the highest ranking centurion of the first cohort and being responsible for maintaining the discipline, training, leading the legionnaires in battle. Right, it was a huge deal. They they often advised the legions' commanding officers were prospective leaders among soldiers. So not. Um, always were equestrians, but it could be the case. From there, you you had uh, two options. You could um, become either primus pilus iterum praefectus castrorum, which was essentially the uh, again the office of primus pilus that after completing the, his one year term in that role was appointed to the prefect 
to be the prefect of, of the camp, uh, which meant a lot, as we've seen, because the prefectus castrorum could come from, uh, in fact, very humble background, and but being literally the top guy of, of the legion as a, as a soldier, uh, and or through this equestrian path, were responsible for organizing and supervising the construction and the layout of a military camp, ensuring effective fortifications and logistical arrangements. Otherwise, from the primipilate, you could become the Tribunus Cortis Vigilum, which is interesting because the this guy was essentially an equestrian officer who commanded the cohorts within the Cortis Vigilum that, as you know, was essentially the urban fire brigade of Rome. And they played a crucial role in the fire prevention, emergency, uh, emergency response, and maintaining public safety within the city, overseeing the training, and the organization of the same cohort of, of firemen, practically, that had some police purpose as well, so anti-riot, sort of anti-urban guerrilla, uh, in a way, from which you could advance as Tribunus Cortis Urbane, which um, was, the, in this case, the, the question officer who commanded one of Rome's urban cohorts. And these cohorts were responsible for maintaining peace and order within the city, policing the major events, and providing security to the high-ranking officials. So they acted as something morals, as bodyguards, right? Um, and the, the, the tribune... Um, also oversaw the, the training, the deployment, and discipline of, of the cohort. The further step ahead was the Tribunus Cortis Praetoriae, which was the big deal, right? This was the guy who commanded um, one of the cohorts within the Praetorian Guard, and they operated as uh, the, uh, essentially the right hand assistants of the Praefectus Praetorium and were involved in all aspects of the Praetorian Guards operations, including security, military campaigns, and internal administration. Um, from this, uh, you the from the Tribunus Cortis Praetorio, you could be elected also as Primus Pilus Iterum Praefectus Castrorum. So you could have this sort of uh, career even in the Roman, um, essentially, guards, police and firemen, and becoming a Praefectus Castrorum, which is quite fascinating. Now, from there, you could become a Procurator. So, this, the, the Procurator was, uh, was a question officer serving as financial administrator or agent of the Roman Emperor, right? While not strictly a military officer, certain mm, Procuratores oversaw financial affairs directly related to the military as you can expect, um, and, and such as, for example, the meaning of finan- uh, the managing of the finances of a legion, or overseeing the provisioning of the troops. Now, you could become a procurator, through, as an equestrian, through another path that could start from the, um, the direct entrance as an equestrian to the, um, uh, to the post of Praefectus Cohortis Quingenariae. Now, this guy was an officer commanding a quingenary court, as the name says. This, the quingenary courts were auxiliary units in the Roman army consisting, that's in the name, uh, approximately 500 men. And the Praefectus Cohortis Quingenariae was responsible for the training, administration, and discipline of these auxiliaries. Um, from which, you could be promoted to either the Tribunus Angusticlavius, so serving as a staff officer or assistant to the Legatus Legionis, the the commander of a legion, selected from the Roman aristocracy, again, distinguished by the narrow purple stripe, the Angustus Clavus on their tunic, and essentially assisting the, uh, in, say, logistical matters, coordinating the legion's military operations. Or you could pass from the Prefectus Cortis Quingenare to the post of Tribunus Cortis Miliariae, which instead commanded a military cohort. Right, So cohorts of auxiliary units comprising around 1,000 soldiers. And they were often used to garrison important provinces, because as you understand, they, they had a 
sort of important defensive and deterrent capacity, uh, but also uh, as being part of the Emperor's personal guard, which is interesting. And the Tribunus Cortus Miliariae oversaw the day-to-day -day operations and strategic deployments of these thousand uh, auxiliaries. From the aforementioned two posts, you could get into the uh, post of Praefectus Ally Quingenariae, that essentially was the equestrian officer commanding a, a quingenary ally. So the the ally quingenarii were cavalry units consisting of approximately 500 men, and he would um, say that the praefectus would lead them both in campaigns and routine patrol, ensuring their readiness, discipline, and effectiveness. You would be evaluated on this, right? Because promotion is, uh, of course, there is a sort of etar for which you're expected to go ahead, but it's not, uh, you also have to be capable in this. From the Praefectus Ally Miliaria, you could become a procurator. At that point, you had two posts that you could reach. Um, the Praefectus Vigilum, so the officer commanding the Coartus Vigilum, the Urban Fire Brigade of Rome, that, as we've seen, is something different from the Tribune has, that we explained before. Uh, these were responsible, again, for public order, preventing fighting fires and overseeing criminal investigations within the city of Rome. Or the Praefectus Annonae, so the officer overseeing the grain supply and distribution in Rome. While not directly involved in military affairs, uh, the Praefectus played a crucial role in ensuring the food security and provisions for the population of Rome, including soldiers stationed there, and so he would acquire through this post some uh, significant um, uh, logistical um, insight for how to supply large amount of people uh, in the first place. From these last two offices, you could become Praefectus Aegypti, so the officer assigned to the uh, vital province of Egypt, uh, being responsible for both military and administrative affairs in the province, managing the local forces, uh, collecting taxes, and maintaining the security and the stability of the region. From those aforementioned two offices, you could, however, also directly step into the office of Praefectus, Praefectus Praetorio, so the, the equestrian officer commanding the Praetorian Guard, the elite imperial bodyguard unit tasked with protecting the emperor, made a video about, um, say, the, this, at least in the uh, Augustan order, among various other aspects. And through primarily a security role, the Praetorian Guard could be deployed, as you know, uh, in uh, military campaigns, and the Praefectus Praetorio played it does a significant role, to say the least, in both military and political affairs uh, of the empire. And so we will see also that task in some more uh, in-depth video. All right? But this is fundamentally the picture which I think uh, is the, the most brief sort of um, way of, of introducing these uh, officers' posts and their... Uh, their command, their uh, their mansions, and uh, I think that uh, say it, it it reveals a lot about the complexity, let's say the the compaction, the the pervasive sort of um, uh, also competence, experience that these opportunities could this um, that this command provided these guys with, aside from being opportunities for them. And so, being also say just about not not a career because they were they belong to the highest orders, but um, really knowing what uh, the empire was ruled by, because through these commands, uh, the empire was 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 ruled. Right? It was de facto controlled, and so uh, I I think uh, it's quite revealing. And uh, we will get perhaps a bit more in the political depths of this in other videos hopefully soon. 
For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.